There we are. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to this special online event where I'm joined by Dr. Ruth Hurd and Professor Alan Wilstenholm to discuss their translation and publication of Masataka Takatsuru's report on the production methods uh, of pot still whiskey, which was written during his time at Hazeburn Distillery in 1920s Campbelltown. Now, Dr. Ruth Hurd uh, is a coordinator of Mandarin Chinese at Imperial College London, holds a degree in Japanese and Chinese from SOAS, is a, has a Doctor of Philosophy in Oriental Studies from the University of Oxford. But most importantly, I think, Ruth, you're a native of Campbelltown. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, That's right. <laughs> Professor Alan Wilsonholm uh, was a distillery director for William Grant and Sons, is an honorary professor of Herriot Watts International Centre for Brewing and Distilling, Master Distiller Examiner for the Institute of Brewing and Distilling, Chairman of the Scottish Whiskey Awards, but most poignantly, I think, for tonight is the grandson of Peter McGrath Innes, former Hazelburn distillery manager and mentor to Masataka Takitsu. So welcome to both of you. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. So I think, um, Alan, for those of uh, those watching that perhaps missed our Hazelburn Takitsu tasting we did, I think it was in October last year during our sort of online festival, Maybe you could give us all a sort of a, a recap of how Takatsuru um, ended up here in Campbelltown working at Hazeburn Distillery. A bit of a, a remarkable journey and probably um, quite difficult to, to compact into a sort of summary, but you know, give it your best go. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, yes, Masataka Takatsuru, uh, born into a sake family, sake producing family in Japan, and um, did a actually did a, a, a fermentation degree at Osaka College, which is now Osaka University, and joined a, a Japanese drinks company called Setsu Shuchu. Sorry, that's a dreadful pronunciation. You can connect it, correct it, Ruth. Um, Setsu Shuchu, um, which were interested in how to make Scotch whiskey, which had already gained a reputation in, in, Scot in, in Japan. So he, it was decided that he would travel halfway around the world to Scotland to find out how to make proper Scotch whisky. Um, and without going into all the details, this, this, the First World War was still going on. Um, he went across the Pacific and then trained across America and picked up another boat across the Atlantic. And they were still worried about U-boats, landed in Liverpool, thought of going to Edinburgh, and uh, but had been advised by no doubt a Glaswegian or a West Coaster at least en route that he'd be better going to Glasgow. So he rocked up in December to, uh, 1918 and enrolled at Glasgow University uh, in a, a chemistry course. So April of that year of 1919, I beg your pardon, uh, he had a famous trip up to Rothes and um, got a week in a distillery, which was Longmore and Glenlivet. Uh, he also tried to interact with a famous guy writer, book writer called Nettleton, who's got a fantastic tome about producing alcohol in Victorian Britain. Uh, but that didn't bear fruit, but he had a great time going around Longmorn, Glenlivet and Rothes. Um, returning to his studies, he had also uh, moved uh, from Glasgow to take up digs with a family in Kirkintilloch. I'm not going to do the full Masson breakfast series uh, report, but effectively uh, he fell in love with the daughter of the family and eventually in January 1920, they married um, without the approval of either parent. So it's nice to do it was uh, evenly balanced. Um, he'd, he'd also signed up at uh, Strathclyde College and his, prof his professor there, Forsyth Wilson, seems to have had good business contacts in Glasgow, probably because they had been working together throughout the First World War when the grain distilleries were making alcohol for munitions. Anyway, what Masataka Takatsuru really wanted to do was to get in and understand blending, the blending of malts and grains, but that mm -hmm. was considered highly secret and uh, nobody was willing to let him do that. But probably Peter Mackey, who owned White Horse and who had just bought Hazelburn, I think at the end of uh, 1918, said, oh, well, you know, why don't you go down to um, Hazelburn, I've, I've got a new manager in there. He's he's shaking the place up and go down there and uh, you can have a look at malt distilling. 
So that meant that in February 1920, with his new wife, he took up uh, lodgings in Campbellton and spent, nobody's exactly sure, but about four months, which is quite a long sojourn uh, in Hazelburn Distillery, mm -hmm. learning everything he could about malt whiskey production. Yeah, I mean, a, a fascinating journey to, to get to Hazelburn Distillery in Campbelltown. And I think it's always important to remember this was 1920s Campbelltown, and there probably wouldn't be too many men like uh, um, Tatsui in in Scotland, let alone Campbelltown. So, um, yeah, a remarkable journey to and a remarkable project for him to take on, I think. Yes, I, I don't think he was by any manner of means the first uh, Japanese person or Japanese student to have reached uh, Scotland. There'd been the uh, the um, connections with Japan from Glover, the Scotch, Scottish samurai. There'd been a lot of people over studying shipbuilding and as, as with everything um, they, they learned very quickly. So he wasn't the first Japanese, but they would not have been um, in any way a large number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Ruth, I think uh, this was originally started off as something that was um, you were you were doing with. Can you sort of give us a bit of background to how you got involved in the project, or its inception, really? Yes. Um, well, I had I can't remember exactly when I became aware of Taketsuru, but I certainly um, that was certainly as early as twenty fourteen when I saw. Uh, some of the drama because I can actually get um, Japanese television and I realized that you know I had I'd heard about the popularity of the dramatization of his life after he returned to Japan um, and I ha my friends in Japan were aware of that interest and a particular one um, got in touch with the uh, Scotch Whiskey Society in Japan um, which was making available to enthusiasts uh, facsimile copies of the two notebooks that Taketsuru had written while he was in Campbelltown. And she sent those to me. And, you know, I was very grateful to receive them, but I didn't see <laughs> what good they were going to be to me because it, I thought, well, this is all science. Mm -hmm. And I had already started um, a book project on Taketsuru, but I wasn't going to be writing about any of the um, techniques of distilling, I didn't think. But then it did occur to me that there might be something there that would be useful for my other book project. And of course, have been doing this research, I came across Peter Margach Innes. And um, as I was sort of going around the internet, as you do, I came across a post by Alan. Um, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, the, if uh, this is his grandfather, perhaps he could tell me more information. And I got in touch with Alan and we arranged a meeting at my workplace, Imperial College, when Alan happened to be in London. And he had brought a photocopy of some pages of the notebooks with him. And I had brought the actual facsimile notebooks to show him. <laughs> and um, it just suddenly proceeded from there. I think um, I, th I think it started off just as as my being willing to translate it for Alan's interest, um, in the hope that it would also throw up something that I could use in my book. And and but the more we did it, I think the more we realised that you know this is a very important historical document that that mm -hmm. people in Scotland and elsewhere are bound to have an interest in. Um, because, as it says in the blurb, you know, it is a snapshot of how whiskey was being produced in Campbelltown in 1920, um, just before the Campbelltown whiskey fell off a cliff, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so that's where we just took it from there, really. I don't know if Alan has anything else to, to add to that. No, no. Well, actually, it was it was I thought it was quite funny. I thought I had this I had acquired a photocopy of it in Japanese by a very circuitous route. Uh, and, you know, sort of I thought I was absolutely, you know, top dog because here I had this <laughs> piece of paper. You, you were and, out and, trumped by Ruth. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah so, you know, I had this bit of paper and Ruth just kind of opened the drawer of her desk and pulls out the whole book in <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> so I. Uh, Initially, I, I, I totally, my sole objective, it was not to get it published, 
my sole objective was just to read the text and mm -hmm. understand and and obviously because of the interest of my grandfather uh, being involved um uh, I, I, you know, what I was really hoping was that it was a whole bunch of war stories about how they sat together in the evenings over, you know, a couple of good drams, you know, mm -hmm. telling each other war, you know, war stories about alcohol production and other things. Um, uh, but as we got into it, although um, Master Takatsuru is, is, is very, um, the first thing he does is, is thank, uh, you know, my grandfather, Peter Margarinus, who he describes as a ch the chief technician when, he, of course, he was the manager. <laughs> but I think he was trying to make him sound a more impressive, grander, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So oh, yeah. We, we all we all do that in our CVs, don't we? <laughs> yes, exactly. What, this is on somebody else's CV. And, uh, so he. So basically, after that, it, the more we got into it, I said, "This is a really detailed process of how to make whiskey." Now, how to make whiskey in the 1920s? It's a snapshot, and when you're in the I, my own background of whiskey goes back 50 years to the early 70s and things have changed so much in 50 years and even more than 100 and while you're in it you don't realize each little incremental step changes things so yeah. over 100 years there's been a, a lot of change with one with one obvious exception um uh, which is spring bank mm -hmm. <laughs> um the where most of the the really you know masataka takatsuru would recognize spring bank mm -hmm. if he walked in uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow um, but other than that, most of the industry has moved on, adopted new methods, new fuels and all that. So w then we started deciding that it would just be good to get the text translated. Um, but then it, 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 uh, it got uh, even better than that. And probably wow. a good point to hand back to you, Ruth. Yeah, yes. Um, I mean, I was, I've been very fortunate. I mean, obviously, I'm not, I, I, I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing about distilling um, except what the ordinary person knows. So I, th um, I think that that's it's quite an um, important thing that you have um, both of you from different backgrounds with very different skill sets. And really, without those backgrounds and skill sets coming together, we probably wouldn't be in a position. There's probably not too many people that have this sort of combination of skill sets with the sort of linguistic and sort of more historical um sort of japanese linguistics and their sort of technical expertise from not just sort of contemporary distilling peter but even as you say going back um sort of now on sort of 40 50 years or whatever so um and then on top of that this personal connection with campbelltown and uh, sort of your, your grandfather hazelburn um yes. and, indeed, and indeed my mother being born above the shop in above, yeah, the distillery itself uh -huh. uh, literally the manager's accommodation. I don't think my granny was very pleased when she moved from a yoker where they, they, she, as the brewer, he had fell, fallen heir to the owner's house, yoker home, and a lovely, lovely big um, uh, house, which I think disappeared in the Clyde Bank Blitz. Um, but the, but uh, then she was basically, you know, it was a bit like yeah, literally living over the shop. But I don't think she was best pleased at the change in accommodation, whereas my grandfather, I think, would have been very pleased with the the increase in, in status to, from brewer to, to manager absolutely so it wasn't it, my grand my mother wasn't born until a couple of years later in 1922 so okay ah. um just um quickly i'll point out that we have um sort of comments on the the side um of the, our screen here so facebook and youtube comments are both coming up so we can all see that and uh we have tatsuyu uh ishihara apologies for probably butchering your name and saying hello from japan japan 3 30 a.m in the morning so we do have viewers <laughs> well done. from japan there so well done you for for staying up for this um if you do fall asleep you'll be able to watch it again on on youtube later on um if anybody has any questions uh please put them on the, the chat and we can read them out for, for alan and ruth to uh to try and answer as best they can yes yes so I think I'm, I'm talking with Alan, uh, just to go back to the point about the actual process of translation. So um, I think as Alan hinted at, I, I, because of my background in Japanese research, I was very comfortable with reading the, um, the Japanese of 1920. That didn't pose any problems for me, but of course um, the technical side was something I did need help with. And, uh, Alan was enormously helpful. We need also to 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 say thank you to Nika Whiskey, um, who were very kind in in t 
casting their eye over over the translation and and, and shedding light on a couple of um, points that I you know we were a bit vague about we we said that we were going to write it as we found it written we weren't going to second guess Takitsuru um, so but it was still very very helpful that Nika could come in and shed some light on some parts of it and I had a, a checker um, again a non-specialist but someone who helped me and these are they are not they're all acknowledged in the book and um, so in that sense it's a collaborative effort although obviously um, it's Alan and I have put in most <laughs> most of the hours on it, as it were. It's, it's been a, it's been it's, it's taken us not constant work, but the project has lasted for almost two years. Yeah. We, we yeah. by the end of two thousand and nineteen, there were a few commemorative events kicking off for Masataka Takasura's visit, both in Kirkintilloch and at Glasgow University, um, and we were pretty close. I think we were already starting on some of the early translations, uh, but it was kind of once. You know, from the end of 2019 till now, um, we've been redrafting it, redrafting it, honing it. Um, I, I, I pay tribute not only to, you know, um, Ruth's knowledge, not just of modern Japanese, but also old Japanese and even Chinese characters. And she just threw these things in about, well, this is the, this is in one, this is in the other. And I'm going, you uh -huh. know, sort of, uh, <laughs> it seemed very, very complicated. Um, for all the things he did, a handwritten notebook with handwritten drawings with, as far as I could see, very few corrections. Uh, it, it was very, very um, yeah. remarkable that um, he'd managed to do it, you know, because mm -hmm. it wasn't like he typed it out on a computer and then printed out a good copy. Mm -hmm. It was very, very professionally done in comparison with his Elgin diary, uh, which is not written in very neat handwriting. <laughs> and has more or less defeated native Japanese speakers as well. But for this, obviously, he was very concerned that once the notebooks got back to Setsu Shuzo in, in Japan, that they would be absolutely clear and everybody would know what he'd he'd written without a doubt. And uh, so it was a, a really exemplary. Um, in fact, I thought to myself that it was especially impressive because I thought well he can't have had electric light in the evenings but we think there was electric light at Hazelburn at that time because so he was if, maybe doing his overtime by um electric yeah. light uh -huh, making yeah. his notes uh -huh. and yeah, maybe there's, there's, a, there's a couple of contradictions in the text there's one there's one lovely uh one about of course I, I couldn't go into the distillery and take photos. There's a few photos. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, not many, not, not of everything you'd want. Uh, and then wow. the, the other thing is, uh, of course, I couldn't go into the distillery office and find out figures. And, and in uh, Angus Martin's you know, wonderful book of the encyclopedia, sorry, I'm not on commission. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a conversation with an old clerk who said, oh, yeah, basically he was sitting all the time in the office <laughs> writing things <laughs> out. So, <laughs> you know, I think I think you got pretty free reign and a lot of a lot of, um, you know, so, you know, you know, somebody presumably in Glasgow tells you you're you going to look after a Japanese visitor. I, I don't think anybody thought he was going to be there for four months. I think he just kept his head down <laughs> and stayed there and. Uh, Got away okay. with it. You know, so. so they maybe thought he'd be sort of hanging on for a week and then sort of extended, yeah. extended, and then yeah, sort of four I months I later. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the communications weren't so bad good at that time. That probably would have been telephone. But I can just imagine a conversation at some point where the guy in Glasgow goes, "What is still there?" <laughs> <laughs> That's this is surmise. Sorry, this is yeah. Not fun. yeah. So. so Ruth, we sort of touched upon it um, a little bit there, but what were the sort of the challenges from a sort of the translation point of view? Because obviously this, as you, I think you said, this was sort of 1920s Japanese language and um, you know, how different is that to, to modern day um, Japanese? And also Alan sort of mentioned there's Chinese uh, characters in there, which all sounds very complicated to, to me and probably a lot of people listening. Well... <sighs> Not really. I mean, I also know Chinese, so I'm very happy to have. I mean, the worst thing for me to have is a lot of katakana, which is the syllabary they use to write down foreign loan words, so words from English. And sometimes it's not very clear at all what English word they're trying to 
transliterate. So, but fortunately, there wasn't any problem there in terms of because, um, for example, the um, I think we're calling it the propel. Uh, we're ca what are we call we're calling it the mixer in the Mashtun. He he uses the word pro pro propera propeller. So 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 that was that was okay. There were there weren't any katakana words that caused trouble. But he did. I do say this in my translator's notes. There were a couple of Chinese characters that that weren't quite right and. Um, Although I'd, we'd agreed that we were going to translate it as we, we saw it, I thought to myself, well, you've got to make allowances here. He's, he's been out of Japan for a couple of years now when he arrives in Campbelltown. So the odd slip of the hand, you've, I think a translator's um, entitled to make a bit of allowance for that. And in that, in that sense, I did second guess him a couple of times, and I but I got Nika's approval on that. Mm -hmm. um, but these are really minor points. I mean, there was hardly anything like that. Uh, my main problem was that I don't know all the ins and outs of the distilling process. But luckily, Alan was there to sort of keep me on track with that. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. And yes, and I was I was um, uh, happy uh, to really get involved on both the technical and, and the numerical side and uh, there was one point i can't remember it was probably six months ago or something like that that, that i said right i'm going to go through the, the translation as it is at the moment and i'm going to try and satisfy myself as to every figure he uses it, where yeah. it comes from how it derives how it relates to the other and um you know that you know that took really a few days just to go through and working out all the things he has because he has things like mashing programs fermenter filling programs, um, distillation programs, all sort of worked out. And, you know, I, I'm giving also like Ruth, I'm trying to do a reasonableness thing. You know, is is this a reasonable time that he's allowed for a batch of four washbacks to go through? And, you know, we found one type of mistake and things like that. But broadly, the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of the figures he used and the calculations he used, once I got inside what he was doing, um, were very good and very made a lot of yeah. sense. And that, that's and actually an interesting, sorry, a point about the, the sort of the calculations, the, the figures, because he was using uh, Japanese measurements and I sort of more historical or no, not imperial measurements as well. So I understand there was a bit of, um, you'd have had to have convert everything uh, maybe once or twice to, to get to what we know here in the UK. Yeah, well, um, measurements, yes. Um, uh, you know, shakus and kokus, I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, a shaku is a foot and a koku is 40 gallons, 40 gallons imperial. Um, and so all these things and also his, his, his areas, his lengths, all these sort of things in Japanese units. So um, basically had to look these up, make out, make sense of them. And they were very, very logical. But because he was reporting to his bosses in Japan, he used them. Now, I don't think it would have been a good idea to just translate them into metric units or something like that in the text. You'd have lost the whole flavor. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a page or two at the back where the, um, the equivalents are given in um, the Japanese, the metric, the imperial, and also the US where it differs. So if I were, if I were a person buying the book, probably the first thing I'd do would be to photocopy that page <laughs> and have it by my side when I was working my way through it to get a feel for the, for, for the, the units in, um, of measurement. The other thing as well, he was using Celsius. It's quite funny, uh, J Japan was really ahead of us because we didn't adopt um, Celsius and things like that till about 1980. Um, but I started in the industry in the early 70s and you know we were still using Fahrenheit but we were also using um, uh, things like Sykes hydrometers, and this is the one behind me. Sorry, right beside uh, Sykes hydrometers, and and um, the Fahrenheit, and and calculating in proof gallons, and that stopped in 1980. So it was over 40 years where distillers in Scotland, unless they were of a, uh, a particularly obtuse nature, have not been calculating anything in proof gallons, and so that that again came in very handy. Because he was trying to calculate uh, proof gallons and put them back into uh, basically percentage alcohols that would make sense to the Japanese who had already adopted metric units in that area. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'll just go through some of the, the questions we're, we're getting. And Alistair Fearful has asked, uh, "What Hazelburn did I go for tonight?" So 
I'm on the, the Hazel, Hazelburn ten year old um, Alistair, uh, and that's going to be followed up by the uh, thirteen year old Sherry Wood. <laughs> oh, and then, so uh, going off. J- just to do that, to everyone, I've got the the twenty one year old uh, Hazelburn mm-hmm. here as well, which was um, for the twenty nineteen Open Day we did. So I've got a few drams to to get through uh, tonight, um, and it's obviously it's, it's got to be Hazelburn on a, a tonight like tonight night like tonight. Um, there's a question here. Um, looking forward to getting a copy of the book to Denmark. Um, thanks for building, documenting the Campton whiskey history. That's from Morton Pedersen. Um, so it's probably worth saying we'll have the, the book available in our distillery shop very shortly. And it's also going to be available to, to order online. Now, uh, there is, I think one of the other questions was asking about translations. The, the, it is just an English translation at the moment, I guess. That's but believe me, it will be a lot more easy to translate it from English into Spanish yeah. than it was yeah. into English. Yeah, we speak, yeah we're using sort of modern day English now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there we are. An- another one from Morton. How far away is the described distilling process in the notes from today's distilling in Campbelltown today? Okay, I guess that's, well, maybe first of all, it has, um, has, You've worked, um, you know, you've have a, an understanding of this. You've gone through the detailed notes of Takatsuru, but you've worked in contemporary distilling, uh, Alan. Is there has there been a big change from distilling back in nineteen twenties to sort of modern day? Distilling? Yes and yes and no. Okay, <laughs> so yes and no. It, back in back in the hundred years ago, because uh, it is just about hundred years ago. Basically, every the major major feature of every distillery was um uh they they took in their own malt they filled their malt barns at the harvest time generally okay there was a little bit of importing of, of malt from of, of barley from other countries mm-hmm. and then you know they did that the, the guys had probably been out working in the fields over the summer or taking in the harvest the harvest was collected and all that sort of stuff and it was stored dried stored in the lofts and then as the distilling year progressed which would probably be in about you know september to april they, they took off batches of the grain, steeped it, you know, spread it on the floor maltings, only floor maltings, um, and then kilned it. And the, ev- that process was done at every distillery. And naturally, uh, everyone would have been slightly different. Uh, so there would have been a lot of variability. Now, nowadays, I think there's only about seven distilleries in Scotland that still have their own um, uh, floor maltings. And, and some of them, I'm not going to say they just do it for the tourists, but uh, a lot of them have to still import a lot more malt besides. So vast maltings producing good quality, but homogenous malt has reduced a, a variability from, from the whiskey that we see today, in, in my opinion. Now, again, um, one of the happy things was as we, as we kind of went through this project and we started Share, I wonder if Springbank would be interested in this. Uh, you know, they've got the brand Hazelburn. Uh, so, and we, we made contact with yourself before the, the Glasgow event and everything like that. And, and you, you encouraged our interest and, uh, um, you know, supported uh, us in our endeavor. And we had actually planned during ni- uh, 20, ni- 2020 to have a part, as part of the festival, a big celebration of the Masataka Taka Studio story and all that. But that was obviously kiboshed by you know what. Um, so the, 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 the whole thing is that having visited ha- uh, Springbank, uh, where was it? obviously Hazelburn is made, um, the, the, of anywhere in Scotland, and, I, I, and there are probably friends from industry who will be quite happy to challenge me if they don't think I'm right, of anywhere in Scotland, I think Springbank has the most traditional and it's the most like it would have been 100 years ago because it's working with its own floor maltings, taking in its own barley and steeping it using flame on the uh, direct fire on the on on the, on the wash still all that sort of stuff and as i said earlier if master attackers who walked into springbank today uh, he would feel entirely at home and i don't think that same could be said if you walked into some of the uh, large distilleries up north that have been had their output you know sort of um increased incredibly but particularly on the back of being able to ship in you know 30 tonner, you know, sort of uh, trailers of malted barley as often as they like. 
Someone's phone in C rather than mine. I know it's my fault. I'm really sorry. I'll stop in a minute. I'm sorry about this. Um, That's all right. Um, I, I don't. I think um, Takatsura might walk into our still house and recognise a few faces that might have been in Hamilton <laughs> in the 1920s, still going strong. <laughs> well, can I just say that it was what one of the things that was a bit. Um, disappointing for me was that he's got all these photographs and he really uh he says what he, you know they had the stream running um and the children he says the children play in the stream and those photographs i took of the children are the best i took when i was in scotland well i've never seen those i, I don't know if nika has them or not but those young kids playing in the screen stream will be somebody's granny there'll be somebody alive in campbelltown today who might be able to recognize those kids if they had a photograph but there it is yeah, we I have to be right. i think that comes through that he he was i don't know what the japanese equivalent of a renaissance man is but he he was he, he seemed to be a guy who you know wasn't to other cultures but he also he, he was interested in technology um he, he he saw both the science and the art of whether it was making whether it was making you know um uh, japanese drinks or whether it was making scotch he, he saw the combination of the the science and the art but he also had this artistic bent that came through you know in this in the photographing and things like that so he, he saw things in the in these varied ways he wasn't just kind of like you know i need to find out the facts and then rush back home mm -hmm. yeah i i think um nathan is going to pop up on the screen some of his uh sort of diagrams that he he used and that's the i think important thing to mention about the book it's not just uh lots of technical text he's got some very uh almost artistic diagrams um of the the production which i think we're hopefully going to see an example of uh, popping up in the, the stream. oh there we go um, so the, yeah, you can see his sort of hand-drawn or at least traced uh, mash tun, which is, looks very similar to the the one we use uh, at Springbank right now, actually. Yeah, the bottom the bottom right hand uh, of the of the diagram is a drive cog coming into a cog wheel, which changes the the horizontal drive to a vertical drive, which is going up through the middle of the bottom of the mash tun, which then through another kind of set of right angled uh, cogs rotates round uh, on geared wheels and the the paddles kind of um you know stir up and down yeah. and over as it rotates um and and you know he he talks about this and describes what's happening and then he goes on you know he says, and some of the other mash tons in other places you know the drive is from the top you know so he, he wasn't just saying this is the way they do it at hazelburn he was comparing it and contrasting he'd had a, as well as um longbourn he'd managed to get a couple of weeks at a grain distillery called Bones. Um, and also a Gart Loch, which were owned by the Calder brothers. And grain distilling in those days, 100 years ago, was much more like a large version of malt stilling, but with more unmalted cereals uh, cooked. But apart from that, the equipment just tended to be, you know, be like that mash done, but just, you know, sort of, um, you know, five times the size. And you can and you can see how detailed and precise his notes and his sketches are. So, are we? We're not exaggerating when we sort of say this this report, this book, sort of really was sort of perhaps the the foundation stone of the the Japanese whiskey industry, along with Takatsuru's sort of actual experience of doing this. So, how how important was is this text to Japanese whiskey? Oh, it's 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 um it's it's the it's the bedrock of the entire industry now um when when he did actually go back to japan which he 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 left camelton i think he went to visit uh, you found references to him visiting the the war zones of the great war in france uh ruth i know and he and he also visited i think some as well as in america he visited wineries i think he visited some of the wineries um in yards in in france uh um so he he didn't go immediately home but by the end of the summer of 20, uh, 1920 he and his wife rita were heading on the long journey back to japan he took this book notebook which he wrote um there um you know in in hazelburn uh, or in campbellton because that's what you know what it says and he took this and he presented it to his superiors back at the um at the setu shutsu um 
for whatever reason, they had gone cool on the idea of making Scotch whiskey or type Scotch type whiskey or whiskey like the Scots. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhat disheartened, uh, he moved on from that company. And Rita had got a job teaching English at St. Andrew's College in Osaka. Scots get everywhere. Um, and he was also uh, teaching, I think, chemistry uh, there when another um, uh, re remarkable um, gentleman uh, who had seen the same opportunity, Shinjiro Tori, who, who is now, at the time it was Kota Bukaya, um, who had made a, a wine, uh, probably pretty sickly, uh, sweet wine called Akadema, which was to appeal to the Japanese sweet tooth. And he'd made a lot of money doing that, but he also wanted to make whiskey. And he decided to make whiskey. And I, I don't think at that time he was particularly aware of Masataka Takasuru. And he was talking about bringing, getting a Scottish expert to come over to Japan. And somebody said to him, there's a guy down the road who knows all about this. <laughs> Why don't you have a word with him? That, I, now, there's other stories that say, no, 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 he knew him before he went to Scotland. But the, 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 in various of the accounts, there seemed to be slightly conflicting stories about who knew what when or who was mm -hmm. what where where, when. But the fact is that they, they did meet and uh, Masataka Takasuru um, cut a very um, sort of uh, sort of um, valuable deal for a 10 year contract at the sort of rate they would have had to pay um, a, a Scot coming over from Scotland. Yeah, so he, yeah. he got a good deal. And the whole thing was, he, you know, he had to plan, design, build, commission and run a distillery. And that was Yamazaki which got into production in 1924. And that was the first Scott, well, I shouldn't say Scotch whiskey distillery, but you know what I mean? Um, malt whiskey distillery in, yeah. in Japan. And so that, 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 if it wasn't for Masataka Tagetsuru, and if it wasn't for uh, Shinjiro Tori, I don't think there would be much of a Japanese whiskey industry today. That's right, because, um... He then went and set up his own distillery, um, Yoichi, I, which, and then his company Nika. So there's, I think, there's I think there were two, and, two and Nika, the, the, the giants. I think there were two very, there were two very, very sort of, I think there were two strong minded guys, and mm -hmm. I don't think they always saw eye to eye. Um, he, he came back to Scotland in 1925, so a year after Yamazaki, with a sample of Yamazaki. Um, and and the, the reason he came, and Rita came as well, but, she, you know, she went and visited her family, as, as you would expect. Um, but by that time, Peter Marvathinus had been moved by um, Peter Mackey to Craig and Moore Distillery, which he'd um, acquired a major share in uh, up in Ballandalach. So basically, as far as I know, and I think this is correct, um, they met up in Speyside. I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I think they did. Um, and basically saying, here's a sample of the whiskey. We're having a bit of problem. The, the stuff's burning on the bottom of the wash still. You know, have we got the fire far enough away? It was probably just actually building up, you know, skill in, in the mm -hmm. way of having to run the fire because it's very, very difficult yeah. to heat a pot still with a, a, a coal fire. Um, so he came back in 25. He then came back in about, I think, 31. And it's quite interesting that um, several people may know Richard Forsyth of the Forsyth Coppersmith. Um, through Richard's family as well, they, they have this uh, recollection of um, Masataka Takasuru speaking to their grandfather because he wanted to find out how to build a still. Because by that time, he was already wow. thinking about how to set up on his own. And that's when he did eventually leave. Uh, the 10 year contract was up um, in the early 30s and he left and set up uh, Nika initially as an apple juice manufacturer but he couldn't wait to get a still in. And I think he started with one doing both wash and spirit wow. to get some spirit going in the, in the kind of mid thirties. Fascinating. And is there any evidence of anecdotal or otherwise of what this sort of tone was or what people in Scotland thought about Takatsuru taking all this knowledge and this sort of whiskey Bible to Japan to set up? Um, I, probably nobody thought or assumed at that time anything sort of competing on the, the level it is now, but with Scotch whiskey. Um, I, think, was, I think, I'm not sure. I think, I think there may have been, I mean, you know, we all deal nowadays with GIs and, 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 you know, sort of people are very, you know, but London gin doesn't have to be made in gin in this, in London and cheddar cheese doesn't have to be made in cheddar. So you kind of have got to protect your, 
your GI or your your you know your 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 um, your statement, your geographical indication, because once it gets out, then suddenly, uh, you know, I remember a thing called British sherry, you know, and, and you know, I remember, but you know, South African sherry and Australian sherry, you know, and obviously the Spaniards wouldn't be too keen about that. So GI is complicated, but I I, th I think that maybe early on or late 1920s, I think a product product did probably pop up in Japan that said Scotch whiskey <laughs> and that one or two of the Scots when they became aware of this weren't actually sort of ha awfully happy about that uh, of actually calling it Scotch whiskey so um, I think if you read um, Stuart Hasty who, who was the distillery chemist after Master Takataka's the Takasuru's visit to Hazelburn but uh, Stuart Hasty set up the first um, laboratory at a distillery uh, after the visit, and I don't think that was coincidence, but uh, only the Diageo archives would know for sure. Um, but uh, he he was, um, you know, he was he was. If you read him, he he, he makes this comment that uh, something along the lines that uh, he wasn't very happy about what the Japanese were doing. Uh -huh. But then at the same time, as you mentioned the mm. laboratory at Hazelburn Distillery, which was probably the first dis uh, distillery to have a some sort of lab. That was really set up almost I think had, at the I think same time. Been, I think there had been labs before, but I don't think there'd been like dedicated um, distillery chemists. I think Barnard may be mentions um, some equipment, uh, which it sounds like a proto lab in Yoker Distillery. But so I think there'd been people who had bits of equipment and maybe some owners or managers who were dabbling uh, with a bit of science. But the thing about Stuart Hasty was that he was the first, he was taught, he was recruited by Peter Mackey to go down and set up a full laboratory in um, uh, Hazelburn. And you found a very interesting article, Ruth, in one of the drinks papers of about 1922, talking about it. I'll hand it over to you because I, I, I can't remember exactly where you found it. Um, yes, I have to thank Angus Martin for this because. Um, He's got a, so a list of references in his encyclopedia. And um, because you, uh, if you remember, we, um, we, we, we came across, um, okay, I need to back up. So what actually happened was that Nika also supplied our publisher with facsimile notebooks, but they were not exactly the same. And it turned out that there was a photograph there of the draft drying plant um, that I hadn't seen before. And so in search of information on draft drying, I, I looked at the encyclopedia and then I came across this wine and spirit trade record, I think it's called. And I, I thought, well, I have to check this fact. And, and we found an issue. Uh, yes, you, you were mentioning the, um, the photograph of the um, laboratory at Hazelburn. That was in 1922. Now, we know that they had their own draft drying plant in 1920, but whether it was the laboratory was there in 1920 or whether that was created in the interim, I don't know that we know that, do we? By the way, sorry, I just want to shout out a thank you to the publisher, Humming Earth as well, Stuart Johnson, who's been absolutely wonderful and has produced the book and it, it really looks great so we're very grateful to him as well it, it looks be better than you know i've copied away here but you know it looks better than we could have hoped for mm -hmm. yeah. yeah uh somebody had asked uh will you have the book in the distillery shop by the 15th of september we have placed our order um with stuart so we should have uh I would hope some books in the distillery shop very, very soon. Um, so when you come to visit us, uh, you can pick up a, a copy, uh, certainly from, from us at the distillery. Absolutely. Good. Um, I wonder if our, our friend in Japan is still awake at this point. <laughs> yeah, he seems to be. Um, as we understand it, uh, it will be, it'll be a special printing for the Japanese market whether that will delay uh, the introduction of the books into shops in Japan, I don't know, but um, but apparently it's coming out in paperback in Japan rather than hardback. Okay. Well, there's uh, Torben Ernland's already placed the order on the, for a book there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good stuff. I, 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 wonder, I wonder if I could fire out a question. I mean, the, the official publication date was last Friday. Um, Ruth and I got a copy this week. And various people have said they have put in orders. Has anybody actually got the book? Who ordered it? I, I, my suspicion is not yet. But uh, if anybody has, then um, do a shout out, please, and uh, tell Nathan. <laughs> no, I won't wait. I'm not. Go I'm not, not, not going to wait until it happens because I think we could be silent for a while. <laughs> no, I, I, I cannot prove it, but there is no mention in anything that um, uh, of 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 what um, uh, Master Takasuru writes of a laboratory at Hazelburn. Now, no. I think, I think mm -hmm. if he had been there and been a laboratory, you wouldn't have managed to keep him out of it. <laughs> and he'd been writing no. all about it. No, that's very true. Yeah. So uh -huh. I think 1920, no laboratory. 1922, the first laboratory. Um, now, maybe you believe in coincidences. I don't. I think that at some point, you know, Peter Margahinnis was summoned to Glasgow, you know, well, what about that Japanese guy? What, what, were, you, what, were, you, what were you talking about for four months? <laughs> Well, you know, and the fact is that, you know, there's this idea that actually the the um, the, the, the passage of knowledge would have been a one way street. And somehow, you know, the, the person came in and sucked the Scottish industry dry of knowledge and took it off uh, to Japan. Not far from it. I mean, I don't think we had an alcohol production course in a university in Edinburgh. Maybe, if anything, Harriet Watt was doing brewing and things like that mm -hmm. uh, at that time. But I, I don't think there was really anything focused on distilled spirits. But he'd been doing a course on, on fermentation for distilled spirits in Osaka. So I think there was dialogue and there was exchange. And my hypothesis, and if there's anybody out there um, who, from the Diageo archives, please have a look in the White Horse section. Uh, because I, I really strongly suspect that, you know, 1920, Master Taka Takatsura went away. There was some conversation about the amount of science he would have been asking about and, and the you know, things. And in 1920, presumably in 1921, because it's by there, uh, there by 22, a laboratory is being set up, chemists being recruited. And, you know, he's studying what is being done in practice at Hazelburn Distillery in great detail before it's being done anywhere else. Because I think that's unlikely to be a coincidence. But yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, if both sides are clear as to what's going on, you can't really call that industrial espionage. And as, as Alan has pointed out that, you know, the, the, the was a, there wasn't that much in the way of um, courses and what have you. But what I want to just to throw in just is just um, Takitsura does comment in his notebooks about certain aspects of whiskey production that he worries that they will not be able to replicate in Japan. And one thing that stuck very much in my memory when I went to the Glasgow University event was um, one of the representatives of Japanese whiskey brought along two photographs, one of Campbelltown with Davar Island in the okay. loch, and one of Yoichi, which is where Takitsura set up his distillery, and really looks remarkably similar. Yeah. So we can we can be pretty sure that he was searching in Japan for a, a Japanese Campbelltown, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember the, the same photographs from, from that event, and yeah, it was all, almost identical, very similar. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I think, I don't know if Nathan is uh, listening, I hope he is, but worried to throw up the other photo that I think he's got of the ventilators. Oh, well done. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, not, I'm not sure <laughs> if I could be seen around them, but never mind. Um, doesn't matter. Um, right. I, I mean, this is one of the illustrations from his book, um, Two Types of, of Ventilator. And he comments that uh, on the first one, this is the sort they've got in Campbellton. And this is, he doesn't say it, but this is kind of old school. It's it's what I would call an oast type, uh, an oast house type. Not, I'm sure if that's what everybody calls it, but that's why I call it. It's, it's kind of got a little paddle on the right there, which basically will face into the wind. So it turns into the wind to help a gentle ventilation of the malt kiln. So he's got that Campbellton style of ventilator. <clears throat> and he's then yeah, got down. That's, that's very interesting because um, it's the first time I've been made aware of something like that. And, you know, it makes sense to have a, a certain style of ventilator in Campbellton that's different to perhaps the east coast of Sconston. If anybody's well, been to Campbellton, it's a very, very windy little town in there. <laughs> where <it's close laughs> I, I think this probably this style was probably quite widespread across Scotland. 
Now, I do remember a third style because I started my career at um, uh, Caledonian Grain Distillery in Edinburgh, and they had a third style, which basically looked like um, wooden, a wooden beehive um, on the top of, of their uh, ventilators for maltings and things like that, uh, the malting floors. So, but let's stick with the type that's here. The, the Elgin style with the pagoda roof um, is, is officially, he didn't know this, but it's officially, it's uh, patented by Charles Doig, who was an Elgin architect and rebuilt a lot of the distilleries at the end of the 19th century when there was a big boom. And he put this on, he was an architect, uh, obviously artistic, and he came up with this um, in order to ventilate the, 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 the malt kilns. I think maybe as a little bit of a design flourish as well, but it's a pagoda. It's come from the East. There was a big um, interest in the late 19th century when Japan opened up about all things Oriental. So as I see it, I think this, we, 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 we relate the pagoda roof as being synonymous with Scottish whiskey, but I actually think it might be down to being an item of cultural appropriation. Oh. Dis discuss. <laughs> 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 Big statement there. <laughs> I'm, go I'm, go I'm going to get a lot of I'm going to get a lot of grief over that. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, quite a lot of comments um, just saying they're really appreciating that we're, we're covering the, the book in such depth. Um, someone else asked me if we could do more of these webinars. Gregor McLee says, rumour has it Takatsuri turned up to work daily in a kilt and that was more than enough to earn the trust of we Scots. <laughs> no, but I think he was the original man in a white coat. If you see the picture of him at uh, Longmorn Glenlivet, he has got an ankle length lab coat on. And I didn't really, I didn't, I thought, what, you know, what a jerk, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it looks a real, it looks really daft. And then, um, you know, it's almost three years ago now, I was fortunate enough to be out in Japan as a guest of, of Suntory, who looked after me really, really well, but well. But one of the things that they did do was they took me to a sake brewery. And I was thinking breweries, you know, I'm a distilling guy, you know, <laughs> uh, brewery, brewery. I can take them or leave them. I like the product, but um, they took me to the sake brewery. And what struck me was, and uh, you know, the, the focus on hygiene. Um, and I think when Masataka Takasuru came over, he probably thought our distilleries were not anything like in the same league of hygiene as um as the sake because the sake breweries had to be clean or the product would go off and he turned up the white coat because that's how he thought you should make spirit mm -hmm. so as i say i think you could actually claim that uh masa takatsuru is the the original man in the white coat who subsequently, subsequently became the the hit squad from the laboratories of the companies who came yeah. in to um as i think peter mackie says um uh it's good to have a chemist they fair keep the managers on their toes <laughs> <laughs> There is a story that Takis. I, I am a chemist, so I think, yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> there is a story that Takitsuru did learn a bit of, of how to play the bagpipes, but. Um... Oh, while, while he was wearing the kilt, no doubt. <laughs> I, I, I believe, I believe more, uh, more the story of, uh, I do believe the story more that he taught the son of the, uh, the Cowan family jujitsu. I think that's yeah, a more likely yeah. story. Again, yeah. uh, in the other, uh, in the in the other direction, he was aware of things like Scottish dialects, uh, because there was a postcard um, sent to my grandfather uh, because my uncle told me I had it, and uh, it disappeared in a you know a sort of uh, uh, a flit or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's, it, it was basically a postcard to my grandfather saying, "And how are the wee Bernies?" <laughs> <laughs> Talking about his family, uh, the, the the two sons he would have known. And then my mother, who was born subsequently, but he would have met in 1925 and 1931. Mm -hmm. He's, he sounds like a very personable person um, to build up these relationships. And um, he probably wouldn't have got as far as he did in anywhere in Scotland, let alone Campbelltown, without being that type of personality. So it really comes comes through. Alan Winchester has pointed out that Benmore Distillery oh. um, of Campbelltown, which is um, now the, the sort of bus depot, had a doig ventilator. Um, there's also Alan Manchester. Hi there. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> there we are. Excellent. Um, so we've sort of rattled on for sort of almost an hour there, which I think is probably where we, we thought we'd, we'd be with this. Um, 
I don't know if anybody has any sort of uh, last questions to, to throw uh, our way, please do. Um, somebody is saying, Torben Erlund is saying, the 29th of August, it is 42 years ago that Takatsuru San died. Your time is impeccable as the whiskey you produce at Springbank. Well, your timing is as impeccable as the whiskey you produce at Springbank. Thank you very much, Torben. I think Alan Winchester actually met his son when he came over to visit. Um, to, to visit this, the, 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 Alan, Alan, who just asked that question, met him at Longhorn Distillery, and they were trying to match up the photos that Nika had with the background. And there was one photo that they couldn't match up, and it was white walls and everything like that, but it did pop up at the Glasgow exhibition and it was Takasuru standing inside, uh, outside a, a big sign that says White Horse Distillery and that um, that would have been Lagavulin and my, my grandfather must have had kind of a bit of a roving commission because that was another Mackey distillery and he obviously took Takasuru with him on a trip to Isla which isn't recorded anywhere that I know of apart from the fact this photo that Nika has. Fantastic okay great well um I think um, just uh, some people appreciating the tonight's event. So thank you very much for everybody's comments. Um, I guess lastly, I'd like to um, say thank you very much to uh, Alan Ruth for, for doing this. Um, it's a very interesting subject. Um, for ev anybody who is thinking about to c come and visit us, we are open again for tours of, um, for the time being anyway. And we will shortly have our new washback tasting bar open in the, the distillery as well. So that'll be really sort of from the middle of September. We hope to have that open so you'll be able to come and do tastings with us. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll manage to get Ruth and Alan down to, to Campbelltown to some sort of uh, in-person event in, in the future if there's enough appetite for this. And uh, our washback bar, I think, would be the, the ideal setting for that. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a, a great night and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye then. Bye. -bye. Bye.